right, welcome to another episode of the EYC podcast, and uh, welcome to anyone else watching or listening in on this um, from all other sources. We'll be posting this episode in a variety of different places because this conversation today is um, interesting for a whole host of different people, not just our youth group who normally listen to this podcast. But the question today that we'll be discussing does come from a youth. And I've actually brought in a guest today, Father Steve is with us, because the question pertains to our construction project. So I'm going to open us by just reading the question. I'll let Father Steve say a few words about himself in case there's anyone listening who doesn't already know him. And then we'll jump right in. So this question comes from an anonymous submitter. And the question says, why is our church doing a construction project to make the church more beautiful? Why do we do high mass things and do extravagant things since God appreciates all prayer and all forms of worship towards him? It just seems like extra money and time. And what an excellent question for us to talk about today. It brings up several different components, um, the core of which centers around our construction project here at St. Timothy's. And because of that, um, I've invited Father Steve to talk about this because he really has been one of the people spearheading this campaign and has been around since its beginning, unlike me. So I'm going to let him introduce himself and say a few words, and then we'll start getting into the meat of this question. Thank you. Thank you, Luke, and thank you to the person who asked the question. I'm really pleased that you are doing this podcast, and I'm even more pleased that members of our youth group are asking questions. It's all... Please know that that the church in her history has never been afraid of questions, and uh, we're we're always happy to to wrestle with the issues that face us all. and um, And I'm very grateful for ask for you for you for asking it. Um, I'm Father Steve Rice. I'm the rector, the parish priest at St. Timothy's, and I've been the rector here for almost thirteen full years, and um, and have pertaining to the question, I've certainly have prayed in all of our spaces for a long, long time and have have um, you know, certainly been a part of this process from the very beginning and during this pandemic, have been here every day watching it unfold, which has given me a surprising perspective and a new perspective of and some added depths, really, to the substance of what the question is really getting to. So... Uh, to start off, I, I would just love to hear some of the logistics of the project. When did it start? How long has it been going on? Um, maybe perhaps most interestingly, how much is left? Yeah. But some of those just key logistic questions. Yeah, um, it, it's hard for me to pin down the exact moment when the project began. I would just simply say that the origins of it came from praying in a space every day. Um, 2021 marks our 10th year of doing a, a mass almost every day. There was a period for one year we did do it every single day when I had another priest helping. Now we do it um, five or six days a week. And when you're in a place every day saying prayers and celebrating the Holy Eucharist, you really become one with the building and you discover all of its advantages and you discover some of its deficits. It's sort of like building a house and moving in, and then once you're there, you discover, gosh, I probably should have put in more cabinet space or another closet, something you never imagined you would need when you were designing it, designing it. but once you're moved in, you realize um, some, things, some things were surprising in what you needed. And so for us, Focusing on the sacraments, doing baptisms. I don't know how many baptisms I've done in 13 years, but pushing 200. It's a lot of celebrations of holy baptism and thousands of celebrations of the Holy Eucharist. And the more we lived into it, not only myself, but those who gathered around, the more we discovered the wonderful bits of our building, the core, the bones of it, which were really attuned to what churches are supposed to do, which is to be the place where heaven and earth meets. And these sacred mysteries, these sacraments are celebrated. But we discovered some things that were lacking. Um, For instance, the, the baptismal area wasn't always intelligible. It wasn't obvious what was happening and what 
what we believe is happening. The altar um, is a wonderful holy space, but could it be amplified so that there was no question as to what was happening, so that when you walk into the church, a person who has no idea about Christianity is immediately aware, even if they don't understand exactly what's happening, but they have a, a real awareness that something special is to happen in this place, and that whatever baptism is, it's a profound moment. Whatever the Holy Eucharist is, it's, it's a foundational belief of the people who gather together. One of the pivotal moments in this process was one Christmas Eve, during the overflow homeless shelter season, all of our guests are invited if they want to, to come to midnight mass. And a handful of our guests did come up and their reflection the next morning, I thought was fascinating. They had three questions. They wanted to know why there was so much smoke in the church uh, for the incense. Number two, they were curious as to why there were not Bibles in the pews. They saw prayer books and hymnals, which is actually a very helpful reflection. But the third question they had was, why was there a birdbath in the back of the church? Now, clearly they were referring to the baptismal font, but it wasn't clear that that was a place of Christian initiation. It really looked to them like there was a random birdbath in the back of the church. Now, can you do baptisms in, in a birdbath, in a creek? Absolutely. Are they as valid as baptisms that are done in a set apart, beautiful, ornate baptistry? 100% yes. Is the Holy Eucharist as valid on a simple altar as it is in the Vatican? Yes. But I think the question is, if we have the means to make it clear what is happening, and if we have the means to make it a place of, of, of a real sacred space and a place that inspires reverence and prayer, then why would we not do that? And I think getting, and we'll get into this, I'm sure, I think at the heart of the question about what we're doing is is to understand the difference between living out a holy, a, a, um, making a place holy based on what we have, this is all we have available, as opposed to making a decision or a choice not to elevate a space if we have the ability and the means, but we choose not to do it, that's an interesting interesting perspective that needs to be addressed and investigated. And so for us, we had the ability and the means and the desire, so why would we not elevate it for the glory of God, for the inspiration of the people, and to communicate what is happening as we live out our Christian faith? That's excellent. You, you've touched on this a little bit, and I think um, one way to really communicate um, this idea of why does the building matter um, has been the past year, what the past year has shown us about physical space. Um, I know for a lot of the youth listening that they've talked again and again about doing school in their, in their bedroom, on the kitchen table, and how different and often difficult um, it can be to kind of get yourself in the right headspace to do math homework when you're at your, you know, in your bean bag that you play video games in. And it's, and it's two different worlds, and it's really hard to operate, you know, effectively and concentrate in that space. And I, I mean, I know for me, um, being at my desk in my office um, focuses my attention in a different way that sitting on my couch at home does. So I think, you know, to say that the building of the church kind of focuses our attention um, we, we intuitively know that about physical space and how it changes our emotions. Um, one, an, another example I've, I've given in, in my you know, childhood is I would get on a baseball field and I would start to feel my heart rate you know, start to elevate because when I would play baseball, I would get nervous about games or practice. And that, that physical space kind of still affects me in certain ways. And I'm sure that happens to other people in a variety of ways. But... Are there things that this past year has taught you about physical space? That you, I think you've touched on this a little bit, um, but if you could give maybe a couple more examples about how does the, the architecture around us, you know, really focus our attention in ways that maybe, you know, uh, a big gravel parking lot doesn't. Yeah, I mean, I would say immediately is that our faith is not something that only exists in our head. It's... When, Christianity is not a thought experiment. It's a lived out relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you think, just stay with the Bible. 
think about the pivotal moments in the, in, in the Bible that pertain to Christians and how every single one of them is connected to a structure or a place. Christmas, the manger, the stable, the cave, a place. That's a focal point. And most every Christian home, if they, if they can afford it, oftentimes will have some representation of the space, the setting of the birth of Jesus Christ. It's not a philosophical idea that he was born. He was born. Not only was he born, he was born in this place, and that place had significance and meaning. Um, then you go to Good Friday, go to Calvary. There is a cross on a hill. There is a place and that place is fundamental to our understanding of reality and life and redemption. And then, of course, what is Easter without a structure being the tomb? And, oh, by the way, that tomb was empty. So, clearly, as we go deeper into what it means to follow Jesus Christ, we follow Jesus Christ by going to, in, as we go through the rhythm of the church's year, um, by stopping at all these important waypoints that are involved in places. Because we are, we are, the human person is both body and soul, and we understand the world through, through physical, through the physical world. The, our senses communicate to our soul what is real and, and how we grow closer to God. The one biblical story that involves space that has been meaningful to me during the pandemic, to get to your question, is the books of Ezra and Nehemiah have never been, and Haggai, those three books have never been terribly important to me devotionally, but they are now, because that is when the Hebrews were in exile after the Babylonian conquest, and they were allowed to return back to their to their home what was the first thing they wanted to do? The first thing they needed to do was to rebuild the temple. Because that space and the worship of God that takes place in that space lets them know who they are, whose they are, and what is their orientation in this world. What are they called to do? What is their ethic? How, are, how What holds their society together? And it was the worship of God. But the worship of God, again, was not some head game. It was lived out in the sacrificial system at the temple. And for me, being away from the building in the construction and the pandemic, that double whammy, has, just, has shown me that praying, you can pray anywhere, but we don't often do that. People will say to me, you can pray anywhere. You don't have to be in the church. Well, yes, you can, but we typically don't. And I pray much easier in a community, and I pray much easier in a place that is geared toward prayer. Can you play soccer on the um, in the parking lot? Yeah, but it's much better to play soccer on a grass field. And we can think of all kinds of other uh, non-religious examples, why how a space, a structure, is more conducive to a certain activity than others. And one of my favorite architects, uh, Sir Ninian Comper, said that the atmosphere of a church should bring you to your knees. When you walk into a church, you should feel this desire to fall on your knees. And when you walk into a church, the church should be built and designed in such a way as to quiet all of your wandering thoughts. And as we get caught up in our head and we need things to be still and quiet, a space can do that. And spaces do do that. And, and that's what a church when there is attention given to the purpose and detail, a church can can do that. Yeah, we're trying to set ourselves up for success. Right? We're not trying to make prayer more difficult by, you know, reducing the space around us. We're trying to make it easier to pray. Um, there was a there was a there was a French architect, um, Le Corbusier, who said that a home is a machine for living. Mm -hmm. Think about your home. Your home is designed to help you live your life. And you order rooms a certain way, and you have you know various aspects of those rooms designed a certain way. And we all know some homes have better designs than others to help us do the things we do. You know, a simple example is if a kitchen is well appointed and well laid out, and a dining room, it makes eating easier, more pleasurable, and so on. A very good friend of mine said, taking on that line that a home is a machine for living. 
A church is a machine for praying. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be a power plant to generate that spiritual energy that enables us and helps us to pray. And some churches, based on their design, do that better than other structures. Doesn't mean we can't pray in any structure, but some already have that have that built-in energy based on its focus, detail, ornamentation, all the things that we see. And that's a, that's a good transition, you talking about our senses and how they help us learn into the, um, the part of the question that said, why do we do high mass things? The incense, um, I think about what the, what the um, shelter guest said about, you know, the, why, why was there so much incense? Um, and they noticed, obviously, that there was something important you know, the bells are another great example of, you know, something we hear. Um, but to get a little deeper, you know, how is this construction project maybe making these, you know, high mass things um, easier to do or perhaps just giving them more meaning where somebody smells the incense and might think that's a nice smell. How do we translate that into the meaning behind it? I would say that the first, the, the simple answer about why we do high mass things is it's biblical. The biblical standard of worship, both in the Old Testament, as you read Exodus and you have vestments that are that are described, you have the way the sacrifices should be should be offered. But really when you get to the letter to the Hebrews, where it focuses on Jesus Christ as our great high priest, but even more so the book of Revelation, where we have the image of heavenly worship. It's all sensory. It's all beautiful. There's color. There are jewels. There are gemstones. There's incense galore. The only altar in the book of Revelation, in the heavenly um, altar, is not an altar of sacrifice because our Lord Jesus Christ has offered himself as one sacrifice offered for all. But the altar that, that continues, that was in the temple in Revelation, is the altar of incense. And then, gosh, all throughout the Bible, there are all these elements of what this worship is. So a high mass um, ceremonial and all the things that we do is aimed to be as faithful to the biblical image of what worship is. Um, and that's the theological, biblical grounding of it. The practical grounding of it is that, all right, let's just say people assume that the climax of the liturgy is the sermon. It's not. The climax of our liturgy is is the Holy Eucharist, is Holy Communion, but the sermon's an important part of it. But let's just say you're 14, 15, 16, 64, doesn't matter your age, and you're listening to the sermon, and it's just not clicking. Your mind is not there. You really aren't paying attention. And, and whatever I'm saying, or whoever's preaching is saying, is just simply not resonating with you for whatever reason. And your mind wonders. And if your mind wonders, fine. Guess what? My mind wonders too. My mind wonders when I'm preaching. So I understand. So don't feel bad. We should try to focus, but I get it. And, the, and no judgment from me. But if you have a church that is designed for prayer, and every nook and cranny has a purpose, and you find your mind wandering, and you don't listen to the sermon, the words that are given, but you're looking at the art, you're looking at the architecture, you're your mind is thinking about things of God, then the experience is not wasted. Then there is a sermon that you have received, it just may not be the one that I was delivering from the pulpit. But the art preached to you, the, the, the beauty was saying something, the image of the incense wafting up like prayer preached to you. So there is that element that reaches to our core, going through our senses, again, Faith is not simply a mind game. It's not an intellectual exercise. Another example would be people who um, oftentimes will tell me either happy or irritated that parts of the Mass that they heard on Sunday, the sung parts, were stuck in their head all week long. I'll never forget when the athletic director of Reynolds High School sent me a text, and a bit irritated, jokingly, saying, I can't stop singing the creed because the tune was in his head, and so he was going through his day singing, I believe in one God. I mean, that can happen in other circumstances, but the traditions of the church are designed. I mean, 
This is not rocket science. We've known this for a long, long time. And those things that we do, the chance, um, the movements, they become a part of us. And then imagine that. Now you have someone walking through a high school singing the creed. How often does that happen? Not very often. I mean, can it be done in a simple box painted one color with no ornamentation? Yeah, it can. Is it more difficult? Absolutely. Uh, a funny example of this, of how it just becomes muscle memory, is we were waiting for morning prayer one morning. Um, this was before the pandemic. And, um, you know, back when we were in our normal space, you would knock twice on yep. your on your desk to signal, you know, we would stand and, and begin our prayers. Um, and then we would, you know, start with, oh, Lord, open thou our lips. And something, you know, we were five minutes before starting, and something fell, um, and it sounded kind of like two knocks. And the woman in front of me just stood up without even realizing it. And um, kind of after a few moments of silence, started looking around like, why am I standing up? I mean, before she could even realize it. I mean, that muscle memory that we form sticks with us. And whether it's, you know, standing up at a knock, which is a funny example, or singing the creed down the hallway, which is a more serious, you know, meaningful example, they do teach us and form us in significant ways. And... Um, not to not to critique the the original question, um, but it said you know God appreciates all prayer and all forms of worship, and I think you've highlighted an important aspect that in the biblical story, there are clear instructions regarding worship. It is not you know a free for all, um, and I think the intent of phrasing the question like that is to recognize that you know like the poor widow who throws in a mite, um, it doesn't matter how much you offer; it is a matter of heart, but. You know, there is clear instructions and, and gates, you know, around what worship are we supposed to be doing because our actions communicate certain things. Um, that's why, you know, we don't just throw the host away if we have leftovers. Um, what we do with it matters because our actions, you know, demonstrate an element of the heart, you know, what we consider holy. So I think that that's important. Um, and then, um, you know, the, the real you know, heart of the question um, that we can finally transition into is, is why is this worth it? I think when people, you know, ask why we're doing a construction project, sometimes we'll give the biblical rationale, we'll give the theological rationale, we'll give the practical rationale, and then they'll still ask the, you know, I always call it the money question. Well, why is it worth the money? Um, so I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that. Why are we spending this money and this time on it? Let me go back um, to the to that first part briefly about all kinds of prayer. I think the Lord absolutely appreciates all kinds of sincere prayer mm-hmm. and authentic prayer. You know, Jesus, Jesus said to the woman at the well when they were talking about where to worship, that the time will come when you will worship in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? I think it means that we are worshiping inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us to pray, communicates the power of prayer. In truth, that's our authenticity that, I mean, in one hand, we are worshiping Jesus Christ, who is who is the way, the truth, and the life. But there is this idea that, that if we are offering all that we have, that doesn't mean we have to offer a certain quantity um, you know, there's a, there's a certain kind, but, but whatever we have to offer, we offer it. And think about how, let's go back to Christmas and our, our, favorite, our favorite songs, like the little drummer boy. Everyone knows that hymn, and his, his angst was, what can I give? I, and there's another great, um, in the bleak midwinter, you know, I can't offer all these wonderful things. I don't have the money. You offer what you have, but you offer all of what you have, the best of what you have. And I think there's something very, I mean, there's a um, thinking about what God thinks about prayer and worship that and we've talked about before, Luke, about how the first, the first murder in the Bible happened because of worship style. Cain and Abel, at the heart of that story in Genesis, was about the idea of what kind of prayer God appreciates. And it's not that God appreciates lambs over vegetation, we are given a pretty clear indication is that what was wrong in that scenario is that one um, one was feeling a bit of their own pride in that offering, and it wasn't a sincere offering of what they were given. 
and that Abel was offering up a, a purer prayer because he was offering up what he was he had the custody over, and that Cain may have had a bit of pride, and it was making it more about him than about God. So those were both technical, technically sacrifices, but God certainly favored one over the other, and it goes down to the intent. Go to um, another story um, of when Uzzah, when, and this is in, um, uh, oh gosh, where is this story? It's in the Old Testament where Uzzah is, is the ark is being carried, and you're told, he was told not to touch the ark, and the, the cart is off, of, off balance, and Uzzah presumes to grab the ark of God and dies. I mean, there's a, it's a really, really strange story, but it gives the clear indication is that this is a holy thing, and, and what God says to do with it, we should take seriously on that. Um, so I do think that God appreciates and receives all sincere prayer. It's when we make the decision that I am choosing not to offer my best, that's a, that's a difficult place that we find ourselves in. It's not that God needs anything from us. We need to offer our best to God because then that teaches us about who God is, it teaches us about our relationship with God, and it teaches us about how we are to live. It's about respect. If you were to, if you're a young person and you encounter someone who's older than you, if you were to presume to call them by their first name or nickname or hey you, it would be disrespectful because you don't have that relationship with them. Um, is it a greeting? Yes, it's a greeting. But but what, how we treat other people says something about us and how we understand who they are. And how we treat God in our prayer and our worship says an awful lot about, about us as well. So, um, so I think there's tons of biblical examples, for instance, that speak to that. Why spend the money on it? You know, it's a question that, and let me be clear, I'm not at all trying to compare the person who asked this question to Judas, but the substance of the question was certainly shared by the question that Judas asked when the woman broke the jar of really expensive perfume over the feet of Jesus, something that was tens of thousands of dollars in modern money. And Judas was asking, why was this waste allowed by Jesus? And why wasn't this, this asset sold and the proceeds given to the poor? And Jesus was very defensive of her because this was an act of pure devotion, offering what she had and offering it to the glory of God. And yeah, absolutely. We could, we could liquidate our assets and we can give a lump sum to it any agency, to, to the homeless ministries that we, that we associate with or to the food bank or anything else. And then guess what happens? Once we write that check, the gift is over. And that will last how long? Three months, six months, a year, depending on the amount of money. And then the need is still there. And then we're out. Or we could focus on a transformed life and what is the thing, and what are the things that bring about real transformation. And we invest in a place that, that encourages and facilitates an encounter with Jesus Christ, the initiation into his life through baptism, receiving his grace in the Holy Eucharist. And we have a conversion of heart and life. And then we have individuals who are now dedicated to living the Christian life, which means doing the things that Jesus said, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, giving shelter to, to the homeless. And not just for the next six months or six years, but for decades and hundreds of years to come. How many people have gone to ancient churches, fallen on their knees, inspired by the witness and the stability of the place, and have decided to, to live for God? And if we live for God, we love one another. That initial investment continues to, to serve others by the transformation that it invites, encourages, and facilitates. And so in that way, we can give far more to the homeless, to the, to the poor, to the hungry, by focusing on transformed lives than we ever could by taking a collection and writing one, and writing one um, check. And I would also say that if you look at St. Timothy's as an example, 
the radical things that we've we've decided to do as a church the homeless shelter which is a radical step the um the arimathea ministry burying babies even the police chapel where most people don't realize our building is in constant use 24 hours a day seven days a week and i know that because we have uh, we now have a camera out the front door and i can look and see how police officer officers are coming at 2 a.m 4 a.m and we know that four months out of the year outside of a pandemic people are sleeping in, in in the floor in drake hall so on and so forth all of these things the abraham project that we started in 2010 all of these things came after all the smells and bells now i'm not saying i'm not saying that there's a one-to-one -one correlation that if every place does incense and chanting and all that then you're going to have a homeless shelter i'm not saying that all the people who volunteer in those ministries that that's their that's the type of worship that really resonates with them what i am saying is that kind of orientation of a community of putting our adoration of god first does trickle down to the entire community because now we're pointed in the right direction and i will make a one-to-one -one correlation that kind of orientation when we're making sure that we're keeping the main thing the main thing which is the worship of god and not simply i just think this is pretty that will inspire people and turn people toward understanding that we are worshiping god made flesh that we're using our senses and we're understanding that god is in our midst and then from that we recognize we are to serve jesus christ in the poor in our midst and so all the radical things that we've done have really followed and flowed from this radical orientation in worship. Yeah, I think about how many of the saints who are known for their acts of love, you know, going out, serving the needy, um, if you read their, you know, biographies, um, have some sense of transformative experience in front of a crucifix. St. Um, Francis. St. Francis, yeah. Rebuild I, my church before a crucifix, absolutely. And it's those spaces that end up forming people who then go out and are able to do the work. Um, and without that space, you know, that transformation happens maybe in a different way, maybe not as early as it does, but the, those spaces form people to, to lead better lives. Yeah. Um, and that's why, you know, we, we kind of surround ourselves with these things that try to bring us back to a state of prayer. And, and I'll, I'll offer one more um, point about the you know the, the church being a place for the poor and needy that there are so few examples of buildings or places in society where you are encouraged to go and fall on your knees and pray and be vulnerable and not have to do anything not have to be a certain way or look a certain way or have you know an ID badge to get in and, and so on and so forth and the church really is a place for everyone um, and especially for the poor and needy and so these, you know, the great cathedrals across the world are places where the poor and needy can go and see artwork that, you know, if it's locked away in the Louvre, they can't afford to get in there. But the, the churches, they can go and worship and encounter the beauty of God um, for free, um, you know, open and available and encouraged for all people. So I think, you know, with our, with our construction project here, we, we always have had that in mind. Um, the, the people who, you know, sleep on the floor in Drake in the winter months, you know, are 10 steps away or one staircase away from this beautiful, you know, holy, sacred space. And we expect and hope that they do like that one person, you know, so long ago, make that, you know, flight up the stairs um, to share with us in that space. It's a real prejudice to assume that the poor cannot appreciate beauty. It's a very, very dangerous perspective to have. Of course, of course they do, and of course they love it. My best example of this, I love this experience, and I have it every time I go to London, is for me the most beautiful church in London is All Saints Margaret Street. Everyone should Google All Saints Margaret Street. The new vicar is Father Peter Anthony, a friend of mine who has agreed to come here next year to do a teaching series. It is the most radically beautiful it's a jewel box inside and when you go in to visit you there there is not total silence in the church because at least when i go in the morning there's always someone snoring in the church 
on the pews are um, in England they call um, they call them rough sleepers those who who are experiencing homelessness they're always rough sleepers in the pews and they are snoring and sawing logs and they are in the midst of a deep sleep and they're doing it not under the stars but under the canopy of this amazing masterpiece of a church and what better image that for someone who does not have a home to call this their address and to find their their rest there and it's a beautiful beautiful image and you're absolutely right our doors are open and they're open during the day and this church belongs to the poor to those who've never given a dime as much as it does to those who've given hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. it is equally shared because it's not offered to us it's not ours it's offered to the glory of God and that is a unique thing that this inspiration this prayer this sanctuary is given for the whole community given for the whole world Amen. well to close us out um, I would love to hear some of the logistics about going forward I mean how, how close are we I know this past week there's been some exciting developments so is there anything you would like to share about you know what, what's been going up right now I when it's going to end is a mystery I'm hoping Easter uh, Easter would be a best-case scenario which is only three weeks away or so but certainly not too far after Easter I mean absolutely we should I shouldn't say this because I've been surprised we were supposed to be in in October you know and then pandemic messes everything up but yeah we should be in by the end of April easily easily we should be in by the end of April <laughs> What's going on now? Today is um, today is Thursday, March uh, 11th. So what's happening now is they are putting down the the they're framing the floor for the sanctuary. The sanctuary, I mean the 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 far end of the church where the altar is on the other side of the altar rail. That's the sanctuary. They're they're framing the floor so we can put marble tile down. The marble is supposed to remind us of the streets of heaven. This is the heavenly banquet. So that will go in. In a couple of weeks, the triptych, the three pieces of art, will go in above the altar. The altar is almost completely done. Some details and some wood paneling off to the side needs to happen. Um, they're painting right now the arches and the columns. The, um, the choir loft is 800 square feet. It's the size of a, of a small house. And we the, the tile is done up there. And then the, the baptistry will be among the last things. We're waiting. The font is here. It just needs to be put in along with all the other marble tile as well. So the two most dramatic pieces are the east end and the west end. The east end is the altar end. Think about the rising sun comes in the east and we worship Jesus Christ, the, the son of God who rose from the dead. Um, the altar is, is dramatic and the west end where we come in, baptism is how we enter into Jesus Christ. Baptism is our entrance into the church which is why the font is near the door. It's there, it's there for a reason. Those two ends are the most dramatic um, parts of the entire thing. And when you come in, you'll understand this is no longer a place that, oh, by the way, there's a font. This is clearly the space designed for Christian initiation and for all of us who have been baptized to remember what that baptism is. Has meant and what it continues to mean and how it and my one of my favorite little details and there are tons of these details is there's this beautiful work of art above the font and it's a dove reminding us of the dove that came down when our Lord was baptized and the dove is facing toward the altar as a message to us that once we are baptized I spoke earlier of orientation which way are we are pointed we're pointed toward the altar mm -hmm. that's that's where we're going that's our journey not just to receive communion here, but to go toward the heavenly banquet, you know, the, the fulfillment of all things. And the church will be full of those little teaching details that are, that are powerful sermons in stone and paint and wood and marble. Well, how wonderful. Well, I know I, for one, am, am so eagerly anticipating um, the completion and you know, for those who maybe haven't been in the building in many, many months, the transformation will be um, so impactful. And so I'm really looking forward to it. 
But thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, thank you to whichever you student asked this question. I think this is a wonderful question, and I'm glad we had the opportunity to talk about it. And I think it's um, questions that people may have had for a while, and so I'm thankful we finally had the chance to sit down and have an in-depth conversation about it, because I think this does matter so much about the why question. Why are we doing this? So I'm thankful to, to hear some of your insight into that. And I'm, and I'm looking forward to you know, having more and more people come into the building as it nears completion and being able to talk about these minor teaching points. I mean, in learning how this, these artworks and these um, architectural designs preach to us and give us many sermons. So I'm very much looking forward to that. So thank you so much for your time this morning. No, thank you. And thank you to the person who asked the question. It's a great question. It is. All right. Well, for those who are joining us with the EYC podcast, I will see you next week with another question. And to those of you who tuned in in a variety of other forms, thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope you have a great rest of your weekend and a safe journey. Thank you.